Um, the topic I'm going to discuss is low carb management for type 1 diabetes. Um, so just we'll get into the, that talk. So five years ago at age 41 I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes and this tells a little bit about my story um, but also some of the science and, and the choices I've made in how I manage my type 1 diabetes. So standard sort of disclaimer similar to Gary's, this is my story. Um, it's why I choose to use a low carb healthy fat approach to manage my diabetes. It's not individual medical advice. I'm not a nutritionist or a dietitian, but I do have significant undergraduate qualifications in epidemiology, statistics, evolutionary biology, biochemistry, physiology, pharmacology, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. And so that, that allows me to um, read and understand the medical literature and, and to make um, in, informed choices about the way I choose to manage my type 1 diabetes. Um, it's important to note that um, with type 1 diabetes, it, it, if you follow a low carb approach, you will use less insulin and so it's important um, to understand that because otherwise you can go low and uh, have a hypoglycemic episodes if you were just to change without adjusting your insulin dose. Always like to declare my conflicts of interest. I have none. I don't treat patients with diabetes. I don't make any money out of um, speaking or um, discussing diabetes. It's just I choose to do so because it's been so helpful to me. So um, it's five years now since I was diagnosed and I guess um, whenever you have anniversaries it causes you to sort of reflect upon um, you know what's happened in those five years and so that's really the this talk I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story but also talk about what's changed in the last five years because there have been some significant changes in the last five years so firstly in terms of reflections I'm thankful I'm thankful that a maverick orthopedic surgeon much like Arifeki, um was responsible for discovering insulin with a medical student um, and that was discovered in 1921 and if it wasn't for that discovery of insulin back in 1921 then people like myself with type 1 diabetes I would be dead by now so it's a life-saving medication for people with um, type 1 diabetes. The other person I'm thankful to is an endocrinologist um, uh, in, the, in America called Dr Richard Bernstein he developed type 1 diabetes at 12 years of age he's now had uh, type 1 diabetes for um, over 70 years and it was his book that led me to using a low carbohydrate approach and also some sort of uh, insulin dosing techniques that he describes in his book to help me manage my type 1 diabetes and it's been that that's allowed me to normalize my blood glucose levels and hopefully live complication free with type 1 diabetes. The, the main message from his book, he's got obviously it's a big book, but the, probably the most important message is his law of small numbers, which is big inputs you make big mistakes, small inputs you make small mistakes. So by restricting carbohydrates from your diet, and carbohydrates have the largest impact on your blood glucose levels, it allows you to use a lower dose of insulin. And by using a lower dose of insulin, it's less likely that you're going to make errors either on the high side or the low side. So getting into my story, I've, you sort of alluded to it a little bit, I'm a radiologist. In October 2, 2012, so just over five years ago, I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes and my HbA1c at the time measured 11.9. So just so that you understand, a normal HbA1c is under 5.5 and 11.9 means that for the preceding three months and probably six months, I've been running very high blood glucose levels unbeknownst to myself, although I was certainly developing the symptoms of type 1 diabetes such as increased thirst, lethargy, increased um, frequency of urination, a little bit of blurred vision. Initially I was given advice like this, um, this, is a, this is sort of the thing to help manage your diabetes, you should learn which foods have sugar in them, you should eat regularly and not skip meals and they sort of recommend three meals a day plus snacks, you should spread your sugar foods out over the day, eat whole grain high fibre foods more often and choose reduced fat products and avoid deep fried food. So that's the sort of current sort of recommendations. That's the advice that I was given. What that looks like in practice, this is actually a relative of mine who is in, has type two diabetes. He was admitted with a diabetic foot infection and this was the dietitian prescribed to diet from, for this relative of mine. Um, I had advised him maybe he should have some eggs. But you can see he has some sugar in the form of uh, toast, probably got some margarine to go with that some uh, low fat milk, some juice which is uh, fruit flavoured sugar water uh, and some breakfast cereal. So that's, that's what's currently being served to patients with type 2 diabetes battling a foot infection um, 
uh, to manage, and that's the dietitian prescribed diet. Whereas that's something that I might typically have for breakfast. This is the breakfast I had before doing the Noosa triathlon last year. Following the advice that I was given, and you know, doing as best as I could, this was the sort of blood glucose levels that I was, I was um, having. So my insulin dose at the time was sort of 24 to 30 units. It's having daily spikes um, over 7.8 uh, millimoles. Um, my estimated uh, HbA1c probably would have been under seven, but you can see there's still a lot of variability. Um, you see the average blood glucose is quite high, so a normal fasting blood glucose would be 4.6. Um, and you know that you shouldn't have that degree of variability in your, if you had a, uh, if you weren't type one diabetic and you're eating a healthy diet and you're insulin sensitive, you'd have a very flat blood glucose trace. So during this time immediately um, after diagnosis, um, I did suffer with um, some anxiety and you know, became quite depressed, was sort of very worried and anxious about the long-term complications I would suffer. Also just very stressful, the sort of daily management of blood glucose levels. So when you're on this sort of roller coaster, when you're high, you, you feel awful and you're always worried about crashing and having sort of a you know, hypoglycemic event, low blood glucose. Um, I like this quote from Robert Frost, two roads diverged in a wood and I took the one less travelled by. So I did a lot of reading during this time and research and I was trying to decide, you know, why, is, why am I getting this advice to, to eat carbohydrates? Where's the evidence for this? You know, has there been a good quality randomised controlled trial, a clinical trial where they looked at, you know, putting type 1 diabetics on a low carb and a high carb diet, looked and waited for sort of hard endpoint data. I was quite shocked to learn that that trial does not exist. So despite insulin having been discovered in 1921, no one's actually done a trial that looks at low carb, high carb in type 1 diabetes and looked at long term outcomes of that. So they have done trials of intensively managing blood glucose levels. That was the DCCT trial and that showed convincingly that managing your blood glucose levels does reduce your complications. So I took a different approach and my approach was to adopt a um, real whole food approach, which just happens to be low in carbohydrates. Nutrient dense, whole real food. Also with look, viewing food through an evolutionary lens um, to determine whether I thought a food was healthy or not. And so the food that I eat looks more like this. Lots of green leafy vegetables as um, Gary talked about, but meat, fish, eggs, olive oil, etc. Um, I've avoided the sweet fruits, I, avoided, I avoid bread, rice and pasta. And to give you an example of the sort of foods I would eat, this is just a selection of some of my lunch boxes that I would take. So, you know, some corned beef, a little bit of cheese, avocado, salad, a few berries, you know, avocado, salmon, salads, nuts. There's no deprivation in this diet. I don't feel hungry. Um, I, I look forward to eating lunch because it's um, such an enjoyable thing to do. Um, this slide there is a little bit of tangerine chicken with a salad, some nuts and cheese. And you can see there, that's my blood glucose trace. That's the Freestyle Libra, which is a, like a continuous glucose monitor. And that shows you my blood glucose levels recorded for the, for the um, eight hours um, preceding that day. And you can see it's flattened, that curve. And those blood glucose levels are predominantly within normal range now. This is, a, um, this is five years post-diagnosis. This is, again, data downloaded from my... Um, uh, con essentially a continuous glucose monitor, it's a flash glucose monitor, but the same thing, um, shows that um, predominantly, you can see those blue lines, there's a little bit of variability, but if you look between the 3.9 and 6.5 millimoles, the, the majority of my blood glucose measurements exist between those two levels. Um, this device that I'm using records a blood glucose level every minute, and it, every time you scan it, it downloads the last eight hours of data. So I've got a lot more data now to actually see what's happening with my blood glucose levels. And that's an eight hour trace um, showing 4.4 and you can see the glucose is staying within normal levels now. You can see how much it's flattened the curve. Mentioned a little bit about HbA1c. So HbA1c is a measurement of your average blood glucose levels over the preceding three months. It looks at how glycated your haemoglobin is. A normal measurement is less than 5.5. That's normal non-diabetic. And I've managed to keep my A1c under 5.5 for the last five years once I adopted a low carbohydrate approach. Um, just a direct comparison, I showed you this graph before of 
um, when I was following the recommended diet. That's 12 months later using a low carbohydrate diet. Insulin dose went from 24 to 30 units down to six. It's back up to around about 16 to 18 now. Um, I really like this book by Adam Brown. This is a recent publication because a lot of, one of the criticisms of low carb will say, or people will say, oh, well, that's very well, Troy, but there's no long-term studies, right? So that's one of the common criticisms. Um, and I've got two comments that. Firstly, having normal blood glucose benefits me today. I feel better. You know, this is Adam Brown's comments, kinder, more patient, more energy sleep better, smile more, think more clearly. So I'm benefiting by having my blood glucose in range today. Not only that, my HbA1c is better, so I hold the prospect of longer of, of a life without free of complications, and my insulin dose is less. That's not to say I don't have occasional spikes. So every now and then I'll get caught out. I'll think that a food is low carb and there might be some flour in a source that I didn't account for, and I can spike up, but it's relatively easy for me to correct that with a bolus of insulin. Um, occasionally you'll see there my trend line starting to go low, but you'll see that the trend line's a gradual decrease. I've got lots of time to correct that. I can correct it either by having a meal or having a tiny dose of, of glucose. So I might have two grams of glucose or four grams of glucose. The current recommendations for someone who goes hypoglycemic with um, type 1 diabetes would be to have 15 grams of fast acting carb and to follow that up with 30 to 45 grams of a longer acting carb um, and that will trigger a massive spike. The reason for that advice is that those patients uh, or people sorry, likely have quite high doses of, of rapid acting insulin on board and to counteract that they've got to take a uh, larger dose of, of glucose to try and bring the cells out of that, um, that nose dive. Whereas when you're just sort of slowly trending low, you've got a lot of time to correct. Um, the reason that um, having a normal HbA1c is so important is that there's quite strong associations between, with HbA1c with ischemic stroke, heart attacks, um, uh, and um, yeah, heart attacks and ischemic stroke essentially, but a whole lot of other things as well. Um, one of the um, criticisms people have is like, how do you exercise without um, without carbs. Now, I'm no athlete, okay, so um, I'm, I'm slow, but I get there. Um, this was following a 157k bike ride with 2,800 metres of vertical climbing. Um, that's my blood glucose trace for the ride. Um, you can see it, it won't let me set my level lower than that, but basically staying within normal range for the entire ride took me nine hours, and I was having to give myself a little bit of glucose during the ride, but around about four to six grams per hour. Um, if you look at most recommendations, they'd be saying you should be on 60 grams an hour. Uh, a lot of athletes for extended can get away with sort of 15 grams an hour who are doing more of the endurance activities. So I really like this quote from Adam Brown's new book. This low carb, high fat approach works far better than the lame food advice I got after diagnosis. And that's what I would um, second as well. So in terms of what are the changes, there's been some technology changes and improvements in the last five years. And probably the biggest one for me at least has been that instead of doing finger pricks, and I was sort of doing finger pricks sort of four to 10 times a day, I now use the Freestyle Libra, but um, you know, there's also the Dexcom and Med Medtronic has a, a continuous glucose monitor as well. So my, um, the Libra gives me a reading every one minute. Um, the other, um, monitors have their advantages, so they can alarm if you're going high and alarm if you're going low, which the Libra doesn't do, um, and they measure every five minutes. And so I'm not sort of advocating for one or the other, but it's certainly been very helpful to me to look at trends, to look at what different food does to my blood glucose levels. Um, this is from Adam Brown's book. So he, he looked at sort of comparing uh, low carb to high carb, and this is um, what he showed as well. So you'll see graphs like this um, very frequently. Um, I'm uh, on you know, social media a lot and people who are using low carb will often show their comparisons. So what you'll notice here is similar. Um, his results are very similar to mine. He gets this sort of fairly flat trace. This is not particularly scary. It's not a particularly hair rising ride. You can see on a, using a high carb approach, you have these rapid nose dives. And this is you know, when you plummet from, these are Amer American values, but he's plummeting from sort of 17 millimoles down to you know, two or three, and that's a hair raising ride. Um, um, I like this quote. This is from um, Jake Kushner, who's a doctor in, um, who's actually the head of the uh, paediatric 
endocrine unit uh, in Texas Children's Hospital. I like this quote on him. Continuous glucose monitoring provides insult, uh, insight sorry, to self-learning for people with type 1 diabetes. And what happens is a low carbohydrate approach naturally follows as it pr provides the only true path to euglycemia. And I think it's a really important ed educational tool when people with type 1 diabetes start to use continuous glucose monitoring. Um, so you transition from a you know, fairly hair-rising roller coaster type ride to something that's a little bit more manageable. <laughs> The other thing that's changed um, since I was diagnosed with, uh, probably hasn't changed in the last five years, but social media has been really useful to me as well because it's allowed me to connect with other people who are doing the same thing as I, as I am. Lots of really clever people, they may not be medically trained, but clever people in different fields who also have type 1 diabetes and are also using the same approach. And that's sort of useful for you know, um, troubleshooting and also getting some support that, hey, this is not that crazy. Other people are doing the same thing and they're getting the same results. So there's a Facebook group called Type 1 Grit that I'm on. Now has over 2,600 members um, of people using, uh, with, with type 1 diabetes who are using a low carbohydrate approach. Social media has allowed me to connect with other doctors who have type 1 and are also using a low carbohydrate approach. So Dr. Ian Lake, uh, GP in the UK, um, Jean-Charles Vauthier, a GP in um, France, and uh, Keith Runyon, who's a retired physician from the US. There's been some other useful websites, so obviously the Diet Doctor you probably know about, but that's, been, you know, that's useful for sort of recipes and seeing where the science is at. The diabetes.co.uk site has, an, has a low-carb program for people with both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Um, also wanted to go over some of the research. I'm going to Give, give some older research, but also um, some of the more modern research. So we've already um, seen this. The National Academy of Medicine has just said that there's a lack of scientific reddit rigor in the current dietary guidelines. Um, you've heard people already talk about the, the PURE study, um, and that showed that a higher carbohydrate in intake was associated with higher risk of total mortality, whereas total fat was related to lower mortality. And I guess I'm showing you this research just so that um, you know, we can question some of the advice that we're currently given, given that it wasn't actually put to clinical trial. And the, the, one of the comments in the summary was that global dietary guidelines should be reconsidered in light of these findings. Um, Zoe Harkham um, wrote an article in the uh, BMJ that just showed that there, at the time that the dietary, dietary fat guidelines were introduced, there was actually no supportive randomised control trial evidence for that. Um, the Cochrane Group, so the Cochrane Group is a group that looks at, gathers all the science together, does a meta-analysis, and they looked at whole grain cereals, you know, because one of the other criticisms of um, the low-carb approach is, well, you're restricting a whole food group, as though apparently grains are a food group now. It's a made-up concept. Um, and what did they say? They said there's insufficient evidence from the randomised control data of an effect that whole grain diets on cardiovascular incomes that the trials were at high risk of bias with small sample sizes and short term, and that the overall quality of the evidence was low. So I'm not in the least bit concerned that I'm restricting grains from my diet. One of the um, medical directors at Joslin, probably one of the most famous diabetes treatment um, centres in the world, um, a few years ago made this comment. It's now clear that a major mistake was made in the 1970s in recommending an increase in carbohydrates. Um, to greater than 40% of caloric intake. This era should come to an end if we seriously want to reduce obesity and type 2 diabetes epidemics. And of course, um, the great um, uh, outcome this year with our own CSIRO publishing their low-carb diet book. So it's much easier for a medical practitioner now because it's, it's accepted, you know, like we're, um, our own CSIRO is on board. In terms of type 1, I've shown this study before. This was an audit. Um, with patients with type 1 diabetes who were put on a low carbohydrate diet. They reduced A1C, they reduced insulin dose, they reduced their hypoglycemic episodes, so that was a big thing for me, and their blood lipids improved and their weight reduced. Uh, recent randomised control trial, small trial and short, um, but what it showed was that low carb reduced insulin and A1C, and there was also some weight loss as well, which was trending to significance, but not quite statistically significant. 
And then a new um, RCT only released a few weeks ago, again looking at a low carbohydrate diet in patients with type 1 diabetes. And that showed that the low carb diet was more time in normal blood glucose range, less hypoglycemia, less variability, and the cardiovascular markers were improved. So this, these studies are, going, are showing strong evidence now that certainly in the short term, that um, you improve blood glucose control with less variability. I, I, don't think, I think it's difficult to dispute that now. Um, the type 1 GRIT group has had a um, survey performed on them and we're awaiting publication of um, a study that's been performed on them. And this was the comments. In terms of quality of life, easier, better controlled, less hypoglycemia, more hopeful. Um, they showed significant reduction of A1C from sort of around 8-ish, which is fairly, that's actually the average. Average A1C in the type 1 uh, diabetic population is around about 8.4. <coughs> Um, and we're awaiting, this is the uh, trial um, that's performed on that type 1 GRIT group, um, looking at um, the glycemic control um, using low carb. So the sort of summary of the research is, I think, well summarised by an article by Feynman. The benefits of carbohydrate restriction in diabetes management are immediate and are documented, while any concerns about the risk are conjectural and long term. And so... It's fairly simple, really. It's eat real food. Big inputs make big mistakes with small impact, um, and small impact puts make small mistakes. The healthcare begins in the kitchen and prepare meals from scratch. That's the end. Thank you. Thank you.